So it's my joy to talk to you tonight about the word, the simple word, behold. It's, uh, I think, 1,276 times in the King James Version. I'm a Trinosaurus Rex, so everything's memorized in the King James. I have to kind of redo things in my head um, to make them more culturally relevant, right? Take out all of these and those. But this is a word we lose at our peril. This is a word that is embedded with wonder and expectation and, and delight. And, and so I... I, I was asking the Lord, I was just kind of marinating in all the passages uh, surrounding Easter, and I was like, Lord, what do you want me to say? I really, they don't need flapping jaws, you know. Um, I can just talk on any subject for hours and hours and hours, and you don't need that. So I was really asking, what do, want, what do you want me to say? And he said, go through the beholds of Scripture. Well, now, I'm not going to go through 1,276 beholds. <laughs> So I think he let me have the causality of picking a few beholds. I was like, which beholds do you want? But to, um, but to go back to creation, Adam and Eve's footfalls were barely still sunken into the mist of the ground and the, and the dew of the lawn when the serpent appears. And he says something Jesus will say much later take and eat take and eat but what he's offering is coming from a heart that is manipulative and cunning and scheming it's not coming out of self-sacrificial love and self-emptying it's coming out of wanting to entice and seduce and so Eve takes and eats you know the story Adam used to walk in the garden with God. Don't you wish you had a diary of, or a little recording? You know, I wish I had a little iPhone. Could kind of just put a little microphone on Adam and God as they walked. And so God says to the serpent, because you've done this thing, I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll crush your head You'll wound his heel. Let's say that together. He'll crush your head. You'll wound his heel. So I want to talk to you about the movie of us. I've been talking to Hannah a lot about the fact that we are just a scene in a very long, epic movie. You know, you think Lord of the Rings is some big, long, epic tale. Well, the reason epic tales appeal to us is we're part of an epic tale of God's glory. And all of our lives are just a scene. I was praying for someone the other day, and I was very distressed about where they were in their walk. And the Lord said, that's just a scene in her life. That's not the movie. That's not the movie. And it encouraged me. I, I, you know, the Lord kept having to remind me. Because how many of you like to freeze frame screen, scenes and think that's it? And we do that with our lives, right? We think the only thing really happening is our life. So fast forward. And um, here's the word behold. It expresses strong feeling, surprise, hope, expectation, wonder. It's something we can all do. The most illiterate among us, the most educated among us, the richest among us can behold. We can all turn our face, behold, look with wonder. And so let's fast forward, take another scene from this epic movie that we are in. It's God's movie, it's the movie of us. It encompasses all time and eternity. And the Israelites are complaining, they're out in the desert. How many of you have complained in your deserts? <laughs> you know, when I used to read scripture, I'd put my hand on my hip and go, those stupid Israelites. Then I grew up and realized I was them. You know, read the Bible as if it's all over autobiographical of you. It is, we are Hosea. We are Gomer. We are the complaining Israelites. We're, you know, you can't read the scripture if you're self-aware and not find yourself there. And um, so, so they're, they're out in the desert and they're complaining. Now in the garden there was one snake. Now all of a sudden we have an epidemic of poisonous, burning, fiery serpents. How many of you have seen, was it uh, Indiana Jones? Yeah, did anybody ever forget that scene with all those snakes? It's like, mm. gives you the heebie-jeebies even now, you know, 20 years later after watching it. So the land's infested with snakes, and God tells Moses, 
put up a brazen, some translations say copper pole with a snake on it. Now, how do they make it? They have to hammer it. They have to crush it. And so remember our first phrase, you will crush his head and he will wound your heel. So here's this cross being hammered into the snake. Now, don't you wonder, couldn't God have said, Moses, put a lamb on a, on a, on a stick? Wouldn't, wouldn't you have preferred that? Would that have made like the prophetic parallels a little easier? A snake. And tell the people, if they look on it, they'll be healed. Salvation for a look. Spurgeon, in 1857, went to do a sound check at the, um, at the Crystal Palace. There was going to be like 26,000 people that would hear him uh, over that, actually. And so a sound check, you know, they didn't have microphones like we have now. They were pretty much your voice, you know. So he, just, so he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And unknown to him, there's a workman way back, you know, on the second, third balcony who hears it and is smitten in his heart, folds up his tools, goes home, wrestles with God, and becomes a Christian. You know, all for the power of beholding, for looking. But, you know, when we see this snake, we're like, what? Does God ever confuse you? Rafi, does God confuse you? <laughs> Has God confused you lately? <laughs> I could tell by that laugh, Rafi's got stories for us. But it will become very clear in this epic film that we are part of, of God's story, our story. We move to Isaiah 45, and it says, look to me. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole of Scripture. Look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. He doesn't say primarily learn. doesn't say primarily do. He says, look, look, behold, look, behold, look, look. Another scripture says, all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of the Lord. We'll see. What we'll hear about, we'll see the salvation of the Lord. So we get to John and the baptism of Jesus. And John says, behold the Lamb. Let's say it together. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's say it again real slow. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Aramaic says the sin of the universe. You know, I won't go into that because that could <laughs> cause all sorts of problems. <laughs> oh. So why the serpent? Why the serpent? Because God made him, poema, this is the verb, poetry masterpiece, God's poetry was making Christ, who knew no sin, he was perfect, spotless, no sin, to become sin. Now, these are really hard words, and they're very definitive in the Greek. You know, we have lots of explanation, but he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So that's why the serpent in the desert being held up is Jesus actually absorbed into himself all the sin of the world. Now, your eyes cannot behold another single human being, whether they are a child rapist or a serial killer, whether they're a gossip, whether they're rebellious, that Jesus did not take into himself their sin. There's no sin we can look on that we cannot never say, Jesus did not take that upon himself. Jesus took it all. Now, sometimes we think of Jesus in the garden and we think <clears throat> he was dreading the physical agony that was before him. I don't believe that. I believe it's the sin of the whole world. The emotional weight of that. Can you imagine? Have you ever sinned and felt grief? And yet Jesus is taking upon himself every disorder Every sin, every genocide, every perpetrator of iniquity, every despotic leader, everything that you can ever imagine that your heart knows to be true, to be evil, Jesus himself took upon himself that sorrow, that grief, that sin. 
So there's no one you can look at and go, oh, blood doesn't apply to you. Uh, to my shame, today I was in the 99 cent store this morning, and there was a gentleman, I won't describe him in case he watches on Facebook, uh, but I found him singularly distasteful. And I found my heart very drawn to the person checking me out, who seemed very industrious and virtuous and wonderful. And so I said to her, God bless you, sweetheart. And the Lord said, where's your God bless you for the guy behind you? And I was smitten. I'm like, here, I'm going to preach this all to you, you know, and, and I'm not living it. I mean, you know, that's the number one thing, right? You got to live what you preach. And God holds us accountable, whatever we say, man, the next week, right? Do we have to live it or not? Right, Rex? Have to live it. Have to live it. And I stand before you in shame, not immediately looking at that man and thinking, the blood of Jesus applies to you. Jesus took upon himself every disorder in you. Jesus took upon himself. Now, I, I was privileged to arrange some music for a, a lady named Susan Adkins. She was, um, she was part of the Manson family. And she was gloriously saved in prison. She's, she's gone to be with the Lord. Um, there's no one on this planet, no person so despicable that we cannot look through the eyes of the cross, the eyes of the blood, and say, it was for you. And you can be transformed. You can be the righteousness of God in Christ because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because he became that snake on a pole. He became it. Now, 1 John 3, I love this in the Passion. Let's just read it together. Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. He has called us and made us very own beloved children. Now in the King James that says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us. Behold. Behold the snake on the pole. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. Behold what marvelous love. The God of the universe has adopted you. He's burned up your foster care, your foster papers. Did you tell me that, Pam or Mary? I think Mary came up with that phrase to me one time. I'm still, tr I'm still trying. I'm still wrestling with God on that. How many of you still think you have foster papers with God? Like if you do some little thing, you know, well, you're out of the house for calling child services. <laughs> we'll send you to another family. I was kind of raised that way. I was raised three strikes and you're out. But behold what manner of love, what extravagant love the Father has given to us that we are his beloved children. Behold, look. Why can we become his beloved children for a look? We're saved by a look. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It goes on to say in later verses, all who focus their hope on him will always be purifying themselves just as Jesus is pure. Now, this is a really awkward verse. You're like, we're purifying ourselves? What? What? But how many of you have ever seen elderly couples that have loved each other for a very long time and they start looking like each other? <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen that dynamic? I've seen it. How many of you have ever seen someone that starts to look like their dog? <laughs> I, I've seen that too. <laughs> Beware if you have a dog that you love. But whatever we love at, whatever we love, whatever we focus on, right, we become like. And we are purifying ourselves by a look, by a beholding. We are purified by a beholding. Now, we might think we're pretty spiffy until we behold something beautiful. We, we recently were really privileged to be with Adele Esprit Studio in her home. And she does beautiful things. And you might think you're a good sculptor till you see Della Spree's sculpture. But see, there's this transference of creativity and beauty. Isn't there, Della Spree? Like, if you're around beauty, you become more beautiful. If you're around creative people, you're more creative. Rafi, if you're around Perry and Rex, you're going to become a greater preacher. It just, you know, whoever you surround yourself with, whoever you behold, whatever you look at, you become. And so just for looking at him, we become more pure. The reason the, sin of, the Son of God was revealed 
was that he might destroy the works of the enemy. So Jesus on the cross is there to destroy the works of the enemy. Now, what are they? Division, autonomy, rebellion. Everything we think of that's evil comes from autonomy and lack of dependence. If you boil things down to their deepest root, the offering of the serpent in the garden was autonomy. So anything that spurs you toward dependence on God is a good thing. It's a good thing. And Jesus came to destroy the work of the enemy. He came to destroy our tendency to want autonomy. Our tendency to to choose to do our own thing, to choose to do our own way. To all we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us have turned to our own way. The bottom rock of sin is autonomy from God. What did what did Satan say? I will ascend. I will ascend. I'll be like the most high. I'll be autonomous. So be thankful for the things that push you into dependency. They're gifts from God. Rafi, Larissa, there's going to be times in your pastorate where stuff is going to just push you harder and harder toward God and you find yourself face down. It's a gift. Because all the success God has for the two of you, you could get arrogant. So there's all these dependencies coming to all of us, all of us. None of us are exempt from extraordinary dependency. That it's his life, it's his purity, it's his righteousness within us. It's not our own. We, we cannot independently become righteous. We cannot independently become pure. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in him. It's all in him. It's all in him. So uh, Corinthians goes on uh, to say God removes the veil. Uh, Now in the older translations it says we behold the glory of the Lord. It's another behold. We behold Behold the glory of the Lord, and we're changed. As we behold him, we're changed. So this is how the Passion says it. God removes the veil, and there they are, face to face. Suddenly recognize God is a living personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. I believe for all of us, God wants to be a personal living presence. Now, some of you, that's easier than to some of us. I, I've been sharing with a Pam and a couple of friends just agnosticism gnaws like little rats at the, at, at the borders of my being. Unbelief just nibbles like little rats around me. But God wants to be, I don't know what rats nibble around the borders of your being. But they do, right? Is anybody conscious of rats nibbling at the borders of your being? Thank you, my sister. <laughs> There's an honest soul back there. <laughs> yes, they do. And it's probably different rats for different, you know, different personality types maybe what's that pam exterminator yes we're going to call pam's exterminator (laughs) not only gophers but rats right (laughs) yes but god removes this veil and we're face to face recognizing god is a living personal presence not a chiseled stone god he wants to be a personal living presence in our life That's what drove him to the cross, that self-emptying, that self-sacrifice, that becoming sin for us, that we might become his righteousness so we can be face to face. Have you ever had children and they're lying to you or there's some barrier and they can't look you in the face? Have you ever done that? And Bonnie, I'm just going to use you. Like I have a friend that's always used to say to her little kids, look at me, (laughs) you know, and she'd grab grab her face and say, look at me. Look at me when I'm talking to you. But the Lord wants that with us. Look at me. Don't divert your eyes in shame, fear, and guilt. Don't divert your eyes because you failed. Don't divert your eyes from me. Look at me face to face because I've provided the way. I have taken upon myself your sin, every sin you ever committed. Now, I was raised, that was all right up till you got saved, and then, man, you were on your own. But every sin, he's taken all the sins of the world on himself because he wants to be face to face, no hindrance, 
no encumbrances. When God is personally present, a living spirit, the old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free, all of us. Do you want constricting legislation? Do you want to be free? Pam and Brent have been going through some planning process things that have taken forever, right? And all the people in Ondolondo, you know, all the people that have to rebuild their homes are going through huge constricting legislation about what you can do, what you can't do, all the new mitigation standards. And some of those are for our good, but they are hundreds and thousands of dollars. But our souls have more constricting legislation than any bureaucracy you could ever see or know in any country. But Jesus frees us from that. The cross, his blood, frees us from constricting legislation. One of the words for salvation is room to breathe. You like that? Just take a big breath. Room to breathe. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Nothing between us and our God. Our face is shining with the brightness of his face, so we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our life and we become like him, brighter and brighter. The path of the righteous is brighter and brighter till the full day. The beauty of God's unfolding is eternal. Tracy, we're not going to be in heaven five billion years and go, well, yeah, been there, done that, got God. No, the beauty of his, the wonder, the majesty, the splendor, the astonishment. It's why the elders fall on their faces and say, holy, 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 thunk. There's big thunks in heaven, right? Because everybody's hitting their face at the beauty. And then they, they get all their strength and they stand up and they get a new revelation. Oh, thunk. Again. They keep falling. We're going to keep falling at astonishment at who God is. The beauty of our God, the splendor of our God. We'll never come to the end of him. We will never come to the end of him. Have you ever been in a moment you didn't want to end? That's what eternity will be like. The bliss and joy of beholding him face to face. Nothing between. We have become his righteousness. We are his purity. We have become like him because we've spent our lives beholding him. Now, beholding him has some, um, whoops, whoop, whoops, I think, can I, wait, I went too fast. Can we go back? Yeah, here, 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 here. Okay, thank you, Perry. Perry's always saving me. Okay, well, I'll ask you for that in a second. But let me just give you real quick, I'm trying to get Pam out of here because she's going to another meeting. Let me go real quick. What, what are the advantages of beholding him? We get new eyes to see people that educationally, economically, emotionally, we would never, ever look at. And my verse for that is Jesus says, why are you saying it's four months to harvest? Look at the people coming. He's talking about the Samaritan people coming to hear him. Look at those people that you despise coming. Behold. Behold the harvest is now. It's now. So because we've beheld him, the snake on the pole, the spotless lamb of glory on the cross, who becomes the snake, the lamb who becomes, not he becomes Satan, but he becomes sin, we can behold each other differently. People that we have absolutely nothing in common with, like the Jews and the Samaritans. Don't say there's four months. Now, I've heard churches, I'm 62, I'm really old, I was born 40, so that makes me 102. Um, I've seen everything in the church. I've been everywhere, man. <sighs> and I've heard church after church, oh, we're just not ready. We, we just need a little more preparation. We just, don't say there's four months to harvest. Ask God to let you behold the people you would never, ever, ever be drawn to the people you would never think about. And you can look at them through the eyes of Calvary, through the blood of the Lamb, and, and you can know they can be transformed because all their sin has already been taken upon him. They've already been paid for. It changes our relationship 
with each other, it gives us new family. Remember Jesus on the cross said, Behold, mother, your son. Behold, John, your mother. It gives us the capacity to, it says from that moment, John took Mary into his home. That moment. So the reason that we can love each other, the reason that we can be family, is because of the cross, because we've beheld him, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, because we can look at him. The Bible says that Israel will look upon him whom they pierced and mourn for him as if an only son. It's salvation for a look. There will be a day when all of Israel will be saved. That's what Romans says. And it's all for a look. They're going to look at him whom they pierced and mourn for him as an only son. It doesn't just give us eyes for people we would be dismissive of. And, and, and I'm, I'm confessing to you, I did not have that today at the 99 cent store. I want that. I want to be able to look at people that I would not be drawn to. I want to be able to hear Jesus say, Behold your son, behold your daughter. Behold, behold. Joey and I have been so blessed that God's given us a Welsh daughter. We're, we're American parents, and God has been healing places in me I didn't know I needed healing through Hannah. But see, that's possible because of the cross. I, I was holding Hannah the other day, and I said, it's only because of the sacrifice of Jesus that we're in each other's lives, that I get privileged to love you. That's what the cross does. That's what the blood does, is it gives us eyes. Once we behold him, we're beholding each other differently. And then my favorite behold, Revelation 21, God says, in the throne, he says, behold, I make all things new. How many of you have some things you want new? Relationships you'd like God to make new, emotions, memories, traumas you'd like God to make new. That's his promise to us, that he will make all things new. Now, what does that mean? That is personally, uh, on a cosmic proportion, it's not just us personally, but it is us personally too, that God is going to make all things new. Is that a marvelous thought? Because of his sacrifice, because of the blood, he has the capacity to transform this rogue little planet that has been hemorrhaging from the pores ever since the snake in the garden talked about a tree. But God's going to make all things new because the Lamb of God who took upon himself all the sins of the world on a tree says, take, eat, this is my body, given for you, self-emptied for you, self-sacrificed for you. And that God is going to take our little rogue planet hemorrhaging from every pore and make a new heaven and a new earth and a new you, and that's the movie that we're all in. That's the movie, you know? I've, just, we, I've had a little fast-forward button here just taking you through a few beholds, not the whole 1,276 beholds, but he's going to make everything new. He's going to transform everything. And he's in the midst of doing it. And he's in the midst of doing it through us. Pam blessing people. Now she's training people to bless people. And now it's, be, it's going to be an oh, I thing, huh, Pam? Mary's been saying for the last five years, she's been talking about the oh, I blessing. We didn't think it would be transported from Wales, but it looks like it is. The Ojai blessing it was transferred from Wales. He's making things new. He's giving you courage where you have felt hesitant. He's giving you boldness. He's making new the places in your heart that have drawn back. He's uncovering dreams, like Pam said. Uncovering dreams that have been long forgotten. He's digging up things you've buried that were treasure. There, there's someone here, and I, I'll try not to lock on your eyes. It's hard because we're such a tiny little group. <laughs> but there's somebody here that has buried treasure, and God's unearthing it. I just feel so strong in my spirit. He is making new 
your creativity. Maybe you've gotten discouraged about it because other people have critiqued it. You remember when you were little kids? How many dancers? Every, all hands go up. How many artists? All hands go up. Ask it by second grade, less people. Third grade, less people. Fourth grade, you know, by high school, nobody's hand except the ballerinas, you know, are going up. Because we're critiquing and contrasting and comparing. But God wants to make all things new. All, behold, I make all things new. Why? Because Jesus became sin for us, that we might be his righteousness and be transformed and become like him. We're beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Now, I've always had a hard time with that passage, beholding in a mirror. And I just want to suggest something. I'll, I'll submit this to Rex and Perry for actual further Greekness. But <laughs> who looks in a mirror? David, when you're looking in a mirror, is Sophia looking in a mirror? No, you're looking in a mirror, right? What do we, when we're looking in a mirror, now some people say, well, it's kind of a dark glass, it's kind of this, it's kind of that. You know, I've studied all these little nuances in the Greek, but what if it's we're beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we're beholding our own changing? What if it's that? What if it's that? That we're like, wow, once I was blind, but now I see it. Once I was selfish, but now I'm generous. Once I was autonomous, and now I'm dependent. Hudson Taylor, the famed missionary from England, UK, just filled the earth with the word of the Lord. And um, one of my favorite, favorite people in all of history. I'm really looking forward to meeting Hudson Taylor and E. Stanley Jones in heaven. And, um, you know, most people are going for Paul or Moses. I'm going for E. Stanley Jones. <laughs> He's on my list. He's on my bucket list of heaven. Yeah. Hudson Taylor had a professor, and his favorite saying was, Jesus was the only life that went from the cradle directly to the cross. Every life since then has gone from the cross back to the cradle. Independency. That's, where, that's part of this movie we're in, is getting more and more dependent. And less and less autonomous. Less and less, I got this. I know how to do this. I've been doing this for 50 years. No, no, no. No, 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 no. God making all things new is also about the future. And, and Rex, this probably pay, plays into LaPont. Um, Hannah and I went to see Nick Wojcik. He was part of the cultural diversity thing at Ventura College the other day. And so we're listening to him, and uh, he's like trying to give a secular presentation, and, um, which we're all learning how to speak to that world. It's wonderful. And he said, if you just think history repeats itself, no, 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 no. The future is an error like we've never seen before. And that's true with automatic vehicles, with artificial intelligence. All our old models are not going to work. So it's not just, behold, I make everything new. Everything in culture is about to flip into a whole new epic change. And it's not going to be like it was. And we can't rely on our old models. We can't rely on our old systems. We can't rely on our old institutions to work. We're going to need creative people that are problem solvers and people like, of cure, like what Rex and Sherry are, are proposing for Togo and, and the other parts of West Africa, where we are the people who have the solutions because we're dependent on him, Amen. because we've beheld him because we know what he wants to do next. And we can't just flip through history books and go, okay, a nation's this, 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 this. Okay, what, what have people done in the past? What are the best case practices here? What are the best case economic theories for Togo? What, we can't do that anymore because everything's changing. Everything's changing, but who are we beholding? Oh, I'm sorry, I've gone over. We are beholding not Jesus a slump of a savior on a cross, we are beholding the risen son of glory with the empire of heaven draped around his shoulders. That's who we're beholding. When we see him, we will see him as he is, not as he was. I don't, have any of you ever felt bad at Easter because you just couldn't get too sentimental about the cross or, or, or that kind of thing? Have you ever felt that tension of wanting to go back, wanting to feel the sorrow? 
but we're going to see him as he is. And the only thing, the only man-made thing in heaven are the scars. We'll see the scars. But we're not seeing him as he was on earth, becoming sin for us. We are seeing him as the resurrected Lord of glory. Who lifts with pierced hands, Jean-Paul Richter, Jerry would say this right in the French, lifts with pierced hands, empires off their hinges. This is the Jesus we're beholding. So that's just a brief movie of us. That's just a brief, sorry, Pam, I told you, 6.30. Um, This is a brief, what? A trailer, yes. This is a brief trailer of the movie we're all in. And it's God's movie, and it's never ending. It's never ending. We're actually the prequel of the true story. The true movie. We're the prequel. Take the hand of the person next to you. I, we're going to play you a song. Perry, if we can... Uh, yeah. Do we, yeah, just listen to the song. My friend uh, Jimmy Owens wrote this. And uh, listen to this song. It just has been centered in my heart for a long time.
We ask you, Lord, to teach us to behold you moment by moment, day by day, risen, exalted, Savior, with the empire of heaven wrapped around your shoulders, blazing in glory, eyes burning like fire. We come to no small God. We live before no small God. We love no small God. Let us behold you, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, takes away our shame, takes away our fear. Every fear, every fear goes at the cross. All our shame, all our fear, all our guilt. And that we live and are becoming like you as we behold you. Teach us, Holy Spirit, how to behold Teach us, teach us. Just pray for the eyes of each person that you're holding hands with to be opened.